Is it that the times are getting more accelerated or is it that we are getting more sensitive? <laughs> both. I think both. Yes. Yeah, that was a conclusion I came to just a moment ago, too. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, I was um, just kind of looking at different things online. Surf in the web, I guess, is what we call that. And... Um, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about what was going on with the volcanic eruption in Hawaii. And I came across um, USA Today and then ABC picked up the same headline, Pele, the Hawaiian goddess. You know, it wasn't a historical piece. It was a present day piece. <laughs> and it was bringing forth that Hawaiian spirituality, you know, that this volcanic eruption is, is the goddess of fire. And that goddess of fire since 1983, that volcano actually has been active. And since that time, 70 acres of new earth have been created. I mean, the most lava makes the most, you know, it's new earth. It's fertile soil. <laughs> First time it's been here on earth, you know, it gives a new meaning to Eckhart Tolle's the new earth, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, we are creating a new earth, a new way of being, a new consciousness. At the same time, new earth is being created. Fresh earth, a whole new way of being where ocean and land are coming together. It's pretty profound, isn't it? And so to think about that being headlines of our modern day society, that there are goddesses in the headlines of our major media outlets is quite interesting <laughs> if nothing else <laughs> but I want to go further and say it's quite powerful in this series that we're doing on the divine feminine it's really about the walk of the holistic nature of us as both sacred in our masculinity and our divinity those energies being in balance with one another we talk about the divine feminine more because it has been the hidden power it has been secreted away and these times, it's, it's awakening. You know, in the um, South American culture, there is an old prophecy of the condor and the eagle. And the condor people are this more kind of feminine energy people, they say, the intuitives, the nurturers, the heartfelt energies of the world. And that the eagle people are the intellectuals and, and the more mind-focused, the industrialized, the technologically innovative folks, right? And that they say that in the, the way the prophecy goes, that in the 1490s, that there would be, starting in 1490, there'd be a 500 year period where the eagle people would dominate and, the con and almost eliminate the condor people. But that in 1990, the prophecy switched and there would come a time now of harmony where the condor and the eagle fly together. Isn't that beautiful? So from 1983 on, this volcano has been active. From 1990 on, this, and I, I met a shaman in Peru, and he just said there will come a day when the condor and the eagle fly together. And I said, oh, kind of like the lion and the lamb laying down together, you know. But I didn't really know the full prophecy until later and uh, find it really um, fascinating that it is a marker of these times. And so what does it mean to us? Why is it important to us that we um, bring forth this energy? Well, we can see how things are working, right? <laughs> and, you know, the old saying, how's that working for you? <laughs> so, you know, we can, we can continue in the, in the way that we understand power today. Um, and maybe we will continue and maybe we won't continue actually as a species in that way because, uh, because of the imbalance. So it, some archeologists say that it was around the Bronze Age that there were um, weaponry was beginning to really come into to play for us. It was really established. And it was also a time when there was, uh, around that time there was a switch from uh, in many cultures, a kind of she god or a matriarchy, where you know all these little—you've probably seen them before—the fertility <laughs> goddesses and all these figures and idols were found that pointed many of these archaeologists to the conclusion that there was a time when God was she to many of us on, in many places upon the earth, and that a switch came 
around that time. And so, you know, we could surmise that weaponry was one of the key switches and that then suddenly weaponry became kind of analogous with the masculine. And so there was an understanding of power now as weaponry and as masculine, which of course does no service to men or women <laughs> because it, it, it brings out that, that side of us that, that brings forth this um, false sense of masculine, false sense of masculine power. And then it leaves, you know, women trying to fall in line with that and men trying to fall in line with that and hearts breaking all along the way, right? So there is an understanding that we can come to now and now in our modern society, it's not just weaponry, but it's money and time. These are the tools that we use that are so out of balance, right? How many of you ever felt enslaved to time or to the calendar the clock time and the calendar time there's just there's not enough there's not enough there's not enough right this seems to be the mantra of our society we got to get on the wheel and we got to move faster and we've got to do more and more and more and more and there's a point when the the image I always have is mother Mary holding her crucified son and it's like enough enough you know there's a time when we just say enough <laughs> We can't go on like this anymore. And there is an elixir of power available to us, an elixir meaning remedy. There is a remedy available to us that will, will allow us to really grab a hold of the true power that is ours, the divine power, the wholeness that is ours. We know that as spiritual beings, but we walk out the doors of the sanctuary, we get up from our cushions or our altars, and we go out into the world, and it's like, it's hard, isn't it, sometimes to hold that space, to know that truth, to be in that place of, of the sourced love of the divine, the sourced understanding of the divine. And so what tools can, can help us? Part of it is awareness. Part of it is recognizing that every time we say, I don't have enough time or I don't have enough money, we give over to that kind of domineering power where those who would like to hold that kind of power or who seem to hold that kind of power exactly where they want us, <laughs> right? And so there is this sense then we get the us and they going, this dynamic going of, otherness and it's all can be dissolved it all can be resolved as we make different choices out of the awareness of the truth of who we are people of abundance people of God people of a spirit that is ever present flowing love and ones who understand that the heart of the heart is what matters, you know? That we have the innate wisdom within us, the intuition within us that understands how to care for one another, how to reach out for support, how to connect with one another. These are all those sort of relational pieces that we've come to call the divine feminine aspect, and they're in all of us, male and female alike. Anybody seen the movie Black Panther or Wonder Woman? Yeah, so the new Marvel, you know, some of the new releases, they're wonderful for some of us who haven't gotten to be in that heroine role or people of color that have gotten to be the heroines and the heroes. And, and yet, at the same time, it's, the, it's, it's that wonderful part set to that same old story, right? We got to fight, 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 fight. That's how we get power. We dominate, we kill. You know, this is what, what power is about. And we all know, right, that's not power, that's fear. <laughs> you know, that's just a whole lot of fear. And so it is a moving instead to that place where, you know, one of the things I really loved about Black Panther was there was this um, meshing of the innovation, the incredible genius that we have of technological innovation and, and, and it was brought to a higher level. And it was beautiful, it was set in this you know, beautiful earthy context. So there was nature and there was um, relational community connecting power of, of the whole. And then there was you know, the technological, it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in other words. We don't just say, oh okay, well let's unearth all of the gifts of the masculine and bring in all of the feminine. No, then we'll just be out of balance the other way. You know? It's about finding the holistic aspect of this 
finding the, the putting it all together. So, so in Black Panther, they had that kind of innovative technology woven into the, the connection of the community to, in my opinion, where they went wrong in these, but it's, it's a part of our culture, is, is just that it's all about the power over paradigm and the violence, right? In order to, to win, we have to, you know, kick each other. <laughs> so, yeah, I had to censor myself there for a minute. So there is um, studies done at UCLA um, in 2000, actually, Shelley Taylor uh, headed up a group. And, and what they found uh, it was interesting because up until 1995, a lot of studies on health and, and um, anthropological kinds of how we interact with people, societal kinds of studies were always done on men. And so there were some things, of course, you know, key to women's biology that weren't being picked up. And so in 1995, there was a federal mandate that more of the studies needed to include women. And so, you know, and some of these women have now become the researchers too. So, so this woman, Shelley Taylor, and her colleagues started to wonder about the age old idea that every time we're in a stressful situation, there's only two choices, fight or flight. Anybody live under that paradigm, right? <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's deep in our, you know, that's been taught to us. And so it's been kind of consumed in, a, in our DNA and we've passed it on again and again. And so it becomes this idea that there's two ideas. We either avoid and get the heck out or we stand strong and we fight, you know, and that, and that this is it. This is, these are the only choices that we have. And Shelley Taylor noticed that she and her colleagues were doing something different quite naturally when they felt stressed, she noticed that they would find each other around the water cooler or the coffee pot or the teapot. She said, what is this? We're not fleeing. We're not fighting. And so as she began to study more and more humans and more and more animal groups, she noticed there was another, and, and her colleagues noticed that there was another kind of uh, uh, approach to stress, and it is called tend and befriend. And when we tend and befriend, we tend to our children. We tend to those who are, who are not in those hierarchical power structures, at the bottom of the, those hierarchical power structures that have been institutionalized. So we tend to those who need some assistance and we befriend one another in a kind of collaborative way, in a community and working together and so it's, it's interesting to think, to think for yourself for a moment about what is your kind of automatic way that you go on a, in a stress moments. I remember a, a friend of mine, Ben, who used to run the Buddhist Center at Unity Temple on the Plaza in Kansas City. We were chatting one day and he said, um, he said you know, uh, when I am stressed, I go into cave mode, you know, complete withdrawal. And he said, when my wife is stressed, she circles the wagons. And I thought, you know, I, I do a little bit of both, but I could really relate to the cave thing. I don't know about you at the time anyway. And so a lot of us, you know, it, it's, we can begin to think, well, that tend and befriend, it just hasn't been taught to us, right? It hasn't been, we, it hasn't been in our conscious awareness. Yet when we hear it, we go, oh yeah, I sometimes do that. You know, certainly the mama bears among us get the tend to the children kind of thing. And those mama bears are, again, papa bears too, because we all kind of have that protect the children kind of instinct in us, don't we? We all have that motherly, fatherly kind of instinct in us that wants to protect. So that tend and befriend is a big part of what comes forth then in how we relate with things going on in the world. The two choices are not just fight and flee, but they are also now four choices, tend and befriend. And I would add always our fifth and hopefully first choice is within, right? Because when we go within, when we go into that well within us, we get resourced with the living water. I love that story where Jesus and the Samaritan woman are hanging out at the well at midday you know, so it's, it's clear in the, in the scripture that it's at noon, and it's at noon because it's in the bright light of day that Jesus is speaking to a woman, no less, and a, Jewish to a, a Jew to a Samaritan, which was not, you know, the Samaritans were considered lower than the Jews. And so, 
you know, breaking all boundaries, as he always did, he's sitting with her, and they're having a theological conversation. They're talking about where the Samaritans worship God and where the Jews worship God and how there will come a day when it's not about on the mountain or in the temple, but it'll be everywhere, present, within, that we carry the Spirit with us. And here we are in this day, recognizing that the living water he was sharing with her, it was more than a dip into the well for literal water, but a dip into the well of Spirit for the living water. And so that is that, that first choice that we go to is that renewal. But that too doesn't have to be done alone, right? That too can be part of our communal coming together and sharing in prayer, which we obviously do on Sundays and hopefully other times too. In Ode magazine, Lisa Witter and Lisa Chen wrote together this article and in it they said that if the reigning ethos of history is survival of the fittest, that the temperature of today's planet requires survival of the connected. And we've talked about that, haven't we, about how the, one of the fallouts of this um, really lopsided power structure that we live under is loneliness, right? That there are a lot of people in our world that are really dealing with a, a serious um, experience of loneliness. And amongst all these people, what four billion or so of us that are circulating on the planet that there, or there's more than that, aren't there? Um, anyway, there's a lot of us, <laughs> seven billion, that's right, thank you, <laughs> or six or something. Anyway, a lot of us and, and animals and, you know, a lot of life on this planet that amongst all of that, that we can get into these places of feeling so isolated. Sumant Kidd said in the book she wrote, The Secret Life of Bees, she said that in, in the bee colony, if, um, it, it's, like, it's so much about social companionship and physical contact that if, if you isolate a honeybee from her colony, from her sisters, she'll die. The worker bees are all the female bees and they'll, and they'll die without that because they work together for the higher good. There's been a lot of study around bees and how bees form and organize and how they create together and how they communicate with one another. And, and now people are writing books such as um, Survival of the Hive, The Seven Leadership Lessons from Beehives by Deborah Mackin and Matthew Harrington that's used in MBA programs and in businesses. So people are starting to look at these honeybees and how they create together and how they survive and band together and apply it to business and to organizations. I mean, hallelujah, right? We're finding some really, uh, you know, they call this biomimicry when we see things in nature and we make it so, you know, we watch how a bird is structured and we f now know how to fly an airplane. You know, we watch how a bee colonizes and, and creates and makes the hive and communicates and collaborates. And we say, whoa, we could do more of that. It's a very kind of feminine, divine feminine kind of way of being that is being called for. So in the colonies, one of the things is, one of the things that's key for bees is the survival of the hive. So above all individual bee interests, <laughs> Is, is the survival of the whole colony. They're all committed to the greater good, in other words. So it's one of those key aspects as we shift the, para the power paradigm is to understand that we are working toward the universal greater good and that it's not about our selfish interests over, but always looking at the greater good. That raises consciousness automatically, doesn't it? When we start to think about the greater good of the planet, the greater good of the children, the greater good of all people, you know, and, and we begin to share our power, what we also then share is our genius because it unlocks the genius of those voices that have been silenced. I mean, that's the key is that we want to open to all of us getting to, to share the power of our voice you know, when we say that, that common saying in mainstream culture now, speak truth to power, it's, it's a much bigger thing when you think of it in the context of spirituality. Because it's speaking the truth of our being, the truth of our knowingness, the truth of the divine 
it into the true power that we're talking about manifesting in the world. It's a much more powerful statement than is often used as, as sort of makes us often feel like, oh, it's exhausting, right? You know, out in the world sort of trying to resist, fight, 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 or just go in our caves and flee and turn everything off, right? And, it's in, and to realize, oh no, we could actually be drawing upon the power of the, of the whole group, of the whole hive, of the whole earth. So the bees have this really amazing way that they communicate with one another. When they find nectar of a flower, for example, one worker bee will go out and it'll find new, a new patch of flowers or a new flower. It will come back to the hive and in order to communicate with the rest of the bees, it will do what's known as the waggle dance. Have you ever seen the waggle dance? Some of you have. Let's take a look. This returning bee has just found a new source of nectar and is going to tell others in the hive about it. First, she gathers an audience. To do that, she climbs on her sister's backs and vibrates her abdomen. Now that she's got their attention, she begins her dance using a code of movements that tell her fellow workers where her discovery lies. The duration of her waggle indicates the distance to the nectar source. The longer the waggle, the further the flower. And the angle at which she dances across the comb tells them the direction to the flower in relation to the sun. Her instructions are remarkably accurate and can pinpoint the location of a nectar source over six kilometers away. Some of her fellow workers set off immediately to find it. In one short season, the colony's workers will visit up to 500 million flowers and will make around 90 kilograms of honey. That is sufficient to sustain the whole colony through the coming winter when there is no nectar to be had. So what is your waggle dance? <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's an ingenious communication, isn't it? And you saw how interested all the other bees were. It was like, you know, completely like walking with, dancing around with her to get it down, you know, to get it incorporated into the body. And so for us, we can learn a lot from that, of that kind of clear and honest and true communication that is always focused on the good of the whole, the greater good, the universal love. I mean, you know, after I read that article on, on Pele, the Hawaiian goddess, and, and what was going on with the volcano in Hawaii, I was scrolling down, and the very next article on Friday was the Texas shooting. And it's just, you know, <laughs> enough, <laughs> right? It's the piata again. It's enough, it's enough, it's enough, right? Enough already. And so how do we speak that truth and make that truth come true? It is through finding the ways that, that we waggle together, that we communicate the truth with one another. You know, if the truth isn't been given to us on, on the so-called so higher planes, it, it's, it's really a gift to recognize that the power lies within each person and each of us in connection with one another. And that the power isn't about money, it isn't about weapons, it isn't about time, it isn't about the material world, it isn't about stuff. The power is the power of the divine that is so accessible to us with every breath, with every heartbeat, with every movement, with every you know, spoken word. We have the choice to keep aligning with that. Keep aligning with that compassion, that nurturance, that, that care for one another. And what greater sacred purpose is there than to love one another, you know, and to love ourselves by doing so? So the bees really give us that. In fact, the bees, you know, so, so you may be thinking, well, there is a queen bee in the hive, right? So there is some kind of seeming hierarchy. 
And while the queen bee has her role and the worker bees have their roles and the drones have their roles, the queen bee is, is not the sole decision maker. So when the, the bees decide that they want to, um, they need to move their hive somewhere or they want to start a new hive, the way that works is the queen bee goes out with some of the worker bees and they fly to a place until they find a place that they feel like this would be a good place for our hive. And then they fly back to the original space where the rest of the bees are, and another waggle dance is performed. And the other bees fly to the place that they've been directed to, check it out, see what they think of the new home idea. They come back, and if they do the exact same waggle dance, all the bees know we're good to make the move. It's incredible, right? So if only we could pay a little more attention <laughs> to how nature shows us the natural rhythms of how we were designed to be at our best, our most innovative, our most genius, our most clear in our communication, our kindest selves, our most caring selves, our most compassionate selves, our most loving selves can be seen in these kinds of cooperative communities. If we don't get it or we can't really understand it or we don't want to reach to the ways of our indigenous ancestors, then we can at least do the biomimicry of nature and see, wow, maybe there is something here after all. Shared decision making, caring about the whole, the greater good, and clear communication, honest communication. Speaking truth to power means speaking truth. <laughs> It means truth and honesty, and honesty means getting clear and honest with ourselves. And that's all a part of how we restore the kind of power shift we're talking about in the world. One other thing about the ingeniousness of these bees is, you know, you've probably seen the honeycomb and how perfectly that is created. And it's a hexagon. It's a hexagonal shape, much like our hexagon right here. And the hexagonal shape is one that actually uh, numerologically means things like communication and interfacing and balance and union and unity and truth and harmony and equality. So all of that is symbolized by the hexagonal shape, which wastes nothing. I mean, it's made into a hexagon so there aren't any gaps, so that the honey is secure in, those, in all those spaces. And so we, of course, have this ingenuity. We, of course, have this innovative nature. We know this from all the amazing things that are created in the world, that are invented in the world. And we have in us and, and need to call forth in us the, the collaborative, cooperative, the, the tending and befriending that kind of energy as well. When we mesh those two, we truly do have a match made in heaven within us and without. So, you know, there's, there's been stories before. Um, I, um, I guess it's possible they're urban legends, but I also think it's also quite possible that they've happened where, you know, in one case, I remember hearing about a woman in Chicago where somebody had broken into her home and was going to commit violence against her. And she looked into this intruder's eyes and said, I forgive you and everything stopped. <laughs> and he actually had tea with her at her kitchen table, and they talked about um, him and what was going wrong for him in his life. You know, so, and, and what is that power? What is that, you know, really grounded power that would allow somebody to come from that place, obviously fully grounded in, in, their, in their divinity, but also it is that kind of power, that, that feminine power that doesn't fight against the darkness, but looks at it in intimacy, intimacy, into me see, <laughs> you know, into me see, be not, a, it's courage, it's a different kind of courage. It's not the courage to fight with brawn but it, and weaponry, but it's the courage to fight with the essence of who we are that can see from the heart that there is pain here. And that can be in that place of such power and such courage that can say, I will open to it instead of fleeing. I will open to it instead of fighting. I will tend the wound and even the friend, the aggressor, so that it can melt away. 
So it's a, it's a brave new world, isn't it, <laughs> when we think of those kinds of acts that we are capable of that have happened over and over again in our society. Almost 100 years ago, the co-founders of Unity, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, put out a series of statements of faith, things that they really believed in to try to define this movement as, as really what are we founded in and what are we founded upon and what do we, st and you know, if the Fillmores said it back in the day, that sort of principle-based kind of declaration of affirmation, nobody questioned it, <laughs> you know, after it was spoken. It was spoken from that place of, of real strength and power, you know, real bringing forth the power through the spoken word. And so Charles and Fillmore wrote this, I believe that the Holy Mother, the divine feminine, is now being restored to her righteous place in the world and that she will reign equal with Jehovah in the heavens and the earth. And so it has come, right? Over 100 years ago, that was written. Over 2,000 years ago, we had Jesus demonstrating this kind of equality, this kind of need for balance and wholeness. He likened himself to a mother hen who wants to gather up Jerusalem under his wings. He likened, you know, things to some of the scriptures liken the, the eagle's nest and the nesting. There was a lot of imagery of, of mothering, of that kind of energy, of nurturance. So it's not new, <laughs> but it's needed. And it feels to me like more, more and more urgently needed and more and more accessible because more and more of us are waking up to it and recognizing what a healing balm that is for men to be able to let go of all that energy that has to be so strong and protective in that physical way. And what a healing balm for women to be able to access and actually have recognized that power that we've always had access to. And what a healing balm for us as men and as women or however we identify in the gender spectrum to bring forth the energies, both energies that are equally accessible to us now and want to be in equal partnership like the yin yang. We can do this, we are doing this. And as we be, just remind ourselves over and over again of how, just even in the little ways, the next time you say, I don't have enough time, take a pause. The next time you're scrolling through or surfing the web and you come upon that kind of story like I did when I came to the Texas shooting and I went, ah, oh, and felt that grief and then I moved on to something else, you know? Stay with it. Stay with it because it is in the power of that feeling nature that we will burst through the true power that can balance, rebirth, make a new earth. Let's do that together. Let's embody this divine feminine power together, this elixir that can remedy our world and remedy our relationships and remedy our lives. And let's affirm that truth together. Together, I am a wellspring of divine feminine power. So it is. Bless you.